Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 41, The Advance of Christianity in the Face of Mounting Chaos. In the life of St. Patrick, the British patron saint of Ireland, Christianity appears to be struggling under the weight of change. Both he and Gildas speak about how Christians are weak and falling from the faith. Patrick felt that Britain deserved its problems because people had gone away from following the faith. In fact, he pretty much points out that they were backsliding, and he suggests even himself that he wasn't following his faith the way he should. Rather than slipping back into paganism, however, mostly it seems like the Christians in this period were becoming apathetic towards the faith, as I said, agnostic even. So, to Patrick, the British had turned away from the truth and were deserving the punishment they received, not much different from the condemnation that Gildas leveled at the Christian church a half a century later. In the West, however, as the British were captured and put into slavery in Ireland, or through the exchanges of people through merchants and settlers, So as the Irish people were coming to Wales, they were finding Britons coming across on their own. Within the mid-5th century, the amount of emigration, forced or otherwise, created alliances with various Welsh kingdoms and was creating a very different situation in Ireland as more and more Christians were eliminating pagan beliefs in Ireland. The spread and missionary zeal that was found there is one that became very much in evidence within a short period of time. And in fact, many churches bloom in this period of Padraig or Patrick's settlement amongst others. He just happens to be the most famous of them. The church was formalized in organization around the Council of Nicaea in the early 4th century. By the Council of Arles, there were bishops from York and Lincoln and London, likely the provincial capitals of Britain at the time. In those days, the formal setup of Christian governance was centered on the archbishop as the see for the province or for the provincial area, a bishop who was then to cover the civatas and the surrounding area, and then a number of lower-serving priests, presbyters, and deacons who would be the people that would serve in the lower reaches of the church, in the rural communities, in the small churches that are found across the countryside. By Gilda's time, the Council of Tours, there was a bishop for all of Britain. Whether this pointed to a reduction of Christian worship or a symptom of the vacating of cities is unclear. Much had changed about the early Celtic church as it had grown and as the Roman advance had left and the military and civil administration pulls out. The church is basically the last link that most people have to Rome. And because of that, it diverges sharply over time. And we start to see a separation in how and understood the church was and how Christian practices had changed and how British they became, to be honest. And part of the reason why Irish Celtic churches become what they are is because of this influence of the British counterparts. Uh, In reality, this move of communities to a rural lifestyle, which may have had roots in the later conflicts between Rome and her British counterparts, it was an obvious situation. You know, you're you're flock, to put a very faith-filled examination on this, was no longer living in your central locations. In fact, most of the central locations were decrepit. London, by this point, almost doesn't exist as a community. Many of the, the civatas of old are now vacant. So by the 5th century, and in the 6th century, these places are not the focus of where your worshippers and your, and the people who are basically helping you live are. So you need to go where they are. So smaller buildings, smaller churches rise up. There's much that becomes changed about that. And in the process of that, we reach a very different sort of understanding of what Christianity is and how it works and a much less administrative one at that. In reality, these moves to the rural lifestyle, which, as I said, had these roots, uh, the Welsh at this point were much less built on the old Roman methods of bishops controlling metropolitan areas, and the authority had instead slipped to local churches, as I said, based as often in the countryside as they were in the towns, and in the villages, and in the smaller, you know, minor hamlets. 
parish churches and priests were driven by completely different goals from the heavy structure of Christian worship in the rest of continental Europe. They were trying to maintain their flock. They were trying to build an understanding of their flock based on what they had available to them. One aspect of this Celtic Christianity was likely a holdover from former pagan worship, which was declaring curses on people, animals, and things that did you wrong. We talked very briefly about how, during the early days of the Roman occupation, springs around Bath and other places were used as depositories for your request to the gods. You would go and speak to a, a local, probably a local administrator who could actually write in Latin, who would then deposit your curse, your blessing, your, your, your seeking intervention, basically, in your life, into a water source. And this, in itself, probably appears to be a holdover from previous times under the Druids and under earlier Bronze Age worship, where we saw swords and precious items deposited in water sources. So this is a very old, strongly pagan ideal that has continued even into this period. But now, instead of water sources being the central point, although let's be honest, they still exist as a central point, because if they didn't, wishing wells wouldn't exist. Um, what we get instead is the saints are now the focus. You pray to your saint, your local patron saint, and ask them to intervene for you. You know, they're, they're not God. They're not so high up that you can't speak to them about, you know, day-to-day -day life. They lived it. So you can go to them and say, you know, St. David, St. Patrick, St. Telios, please, I need money back that was stolen from me. Can you ha intervene for me? I need this particular idea to work because otherwise my family will starve. I need the crops to grow. You know, Joe down the street insulted me, so please curse him so he never is able to do that to me again. Uh, take his eyesight away or whatever. Fill in the blank option you want. And this concept and idea, like I said, is very old. And it existed for a very long time. And it is very popular in the Christian church in this period in Britain. And it will remain so in the Celtic churches going on later on. And it's a very interesting and intriguing holdover. And like so many other things, it is a holdover from an earlier time period. And also carried forward in this period, not only were the saints a focus of prayer, a focus of desires for vengeance, they also became uh, places of importance for other reasons. And the old ideas that they had about um, holy locations, uh, even some of the pagan gods, as we mentioned before, become Christianized into saints. And it was very common in the periods before the arrival of Christianity for people to be buried in sites near rivers, near heights, and other locations, which would make some sense because we know that in the Bronze Age and in the later Iron Age, we have barrows and mounds that are built up, the idea of being built into a humanized structure that was built, which would be a spot that was elevated above the local area and remained important and holy places even going into the Roman era. We find coins that were buried in the Roman era in and around Barrows. So the idea and concept of, of good luck and, and avoiding curses and evil still surrounded these burial mounds and burial places. So that continues to carry forward into the Christian era. And in fact, the term for a church in Wales, and, and a, mostly the name for churches in Wales, in later times is Llan. But Llan is not, at the time previous, what we think of when we think of church. It was called something different in those periods of times, and in fact was settled in different locations. But as time went on, and of course you can see where the link to the holy sites, to the places of worship, to worship of the dead becomes affiliated with these worships of saints, becomes worship, becomes affiliated with the Christian ideals and identities, and so churches took on a different meaning. So then later, either through the fact that the Christian faith wanted to kind of squash some of the more pagan ideals, or possibly because people thought, well, this is a holy site, let's build a church here, they started to become associated with cemeteries. 
the churches of the previous period were not associated with cemeteries. Cemeteries were not where you went to go to church. That was where you buried your dead. But as we get into the medieval period, that all starts to turn around. And in part because of it's, and unfortunately, we don't know for sure why this happened. But I would suspect that likely this comes down to the fact that these sites were worshipped. They were always worshipped. They were especially held as holy locations and important to the people. And so thus Christianity did what it did with everything. You know, if you had a holiday, now it's a holy day. If you had a special reverence for someone or something, they became a part of the Christian faith in a way. You know, your, your God that you loved, Brigid, is now St. Brigid. Your understanding of, of how Christianity and paganism interacts changes, and everything sort of melds into itself. And so the Christian Celtic Church starts to build on these locations, on these holy spots, and they start to put churches there with the dead. And now all of a sudden the dead are associated with these people. And this happens not just in Britain, this happens around Europe. And so we get this concept that now a church and a cemetery can be the same place, the same location. And in fact, churches then build on this idea by trying to make it important to be buried at a church. It's much more important later on to be buried at a church site than it was previously. And we'll see this. That when we look at early Christianity, they talk about sacraments. Sacraments were important events in your life that needed a Christian blessing upon it, be it your birth, your baptism, your uh, convocation later, uh, your reaching adulthood, your becoming a married person becomes important later on, and your death and your burial. All of these things become intertwined with the worship of Christianity. And so... Thus, just like what we've seen here with burials, one will be able to show that this continues with things like marriage, because marriage, which really wasn't affiliated with Christianity, to be honest, largely before this, by the late medieval period, suddenly becomes a major issue. And where you get married and how you get married and who marries you suddenly becomes very important, whereas before it probably wasn't as significant. When the church itself was not focused on marriage and not focused on, on the idea of marriage, it's not a crucial point for it. It's not a sacrament. But as time goes on, it becomes important. It becomes crucial. It becomes something necessary. And so within a few centuries, going back to our original discussion, being buried in a church or a monastery is the height of something to be desired, not something you just maybe do because you should. Uh, and we'll... Just, as I said, we'll see a repeat of this throughout Christian life. And it becomes a change that makes Christianity much more local. If you think about it, as soon as you get involved in the life and death of someone, if you can make an event important to them that is important to them not just to go to church on Sunday, not just to go participate in the Eucharist, but now it's important for you because you need to be married, you need to be baptized, you need to be buried in a Christian fashion, then the faith takes on a much more important role in the lives of, of people. And likely this is one of the things that comes out of this missionary work that's done in this period, is to create a greater bond between the church and the people. I mean, if you think about it from the standpoint of if most of the people spoke Brythonic, if Latin was not necessarily the language of the people, as the people move farther and farther away from Latin, and the priests don't, and they still speak in Latin, and they still worship in Latin, and they still write in Latin, then the separation between the people and the church becomes very pronounced. And so you suddenly have this problem of how do you make that relevant to someone? If really... They don't understand it beyond, well, this might have something to do with my afterlife. The here and now is always very important to people. And so if I'm going to starve to death because I'm not going to get my flocks in, if I'm not going to get my wheat harvested, if I'm not going to do the shearing, if I'm not going to kill the cow, if I'm not going to be able to make my life in the here and now good, then suddenly it becomes a lot less important to me about the hereafter. 
And so people stop probably paying attention because of that. And you can see it even today. That's a very difficult thing for people to work through. And so honestly, what phase do is build hope. But to do that, they build it by becoming a part of your life and a part of your step through your life. These moments in your life that are important to you as an individual are now important to the church. And so Christianity becomes intertwined with personal life as well as public life. You may not have a scriptural book to read, but you know you have to go to church on Sunday. You know if you want to be blessed by the priest, you had better get your kid baptized. You, If you want to be considering your flocks or cursing your neighbor, you need to have a connection with those saints. The only way to do that is to go to church, to attend those services. So it likely some of this was encouraged by the local clergy because of the importance of it to them and in their perceptions of sometimes getting people to church is more important than what they do when they're there. And there may be a bit of that going on. Again, I'm speculating, but I, I think I'm speculating on some accurate ideas. So all of this creates a church which looks and feels different from the Roman church. You know, Britain is the place where Pelagianism became a very important thing. The idea that you would work out your uh, sins not through dealing with original sin, not through the divine intervention of Christ, but through the actual making yourself more holy, is a purely British idea which came into the Christian church and was then labeled a heresy. It remained incredibly popular, even apparently to the time of Gildas and David. So there was some hold on this old, on these old ideas. And so the idea that the church would be separate from Rome continued to carry forward in some way or other for a number of years after that. And in fact, it continues even beyond that. And we'll see that the split with the Celtic church likely has origins in the way that the British bishops and priests adapted to the new reality they faced of a scattered and agnostic flock. Missionary zeal, adaption, and common realities meant that Christianity was a bit more flexible in Britain. If Pelagianism proved one thing, it is that the British and their Welsh descendants were not likely to easily conform. So the ideas and desires of Rome to see with their British flock understanding things in the same way that the Romans worshipped, with the idea of a, of a metropolitan being the key point of, of the church, that a bishop would be centered in a major town, that an archbishop would represent a larger area. All of these very much administrative and bureaucratic parts of the church didn't exist in Britain in the same way. And thus, they conflicted when the Roman church returned to try and convert the Anglo-Saxons. All of this became much more important. And all of this conflict becomes much more ingrained in the two sides, and it leads to, in the ideas of Bede, a massive conflict that creates a total separation between what was and what is now, and the idea that the predominant understanding and rule of Christianity on the idea that there is a head and you must follow the head, whether that's a local head or, or the Pope himself, you had better follow that line. That didn't work in the British church, and it becomes a bone of contention. And in the 7th and 8th and 9th and even into the 10th century, we continue to have that argument. And the British definitely developed their religious faith based on these comments and discussions that we've had about the idea that the church isn't exactly what it had become and followed from Nicaea. It had evolved and bent with what was the reality of their time, which is that there wasn't a localized place that you could just build a church and set a bishop up. There wasn't civatas anymore. There was rural and, and country churches that were a little bit wilder and a little bit different and believed things a little differently than the Romans did. And so when papal sees start to try and intervene, this conflict occurs and it becomes a major sticking point between the groups. And it begins over other issues outside of the ones we've just mentioned, 
but it begins at these points and it begins at the separation. So the, the Christian church of the fifth and sixth century in Britain is one of, as I would call it, one of saints, missionaries, and differentiation and adaption. You get a much different, well, I wouldn't say a much different, but you get a, a different sort of faith than what you end up with after the Roman return in the seventh and eighth centuries. And the understanding of how to worship, how to work, how to react with your rural and urban citizens and fellow people of faith becomes so different. And it creates a very uniform situation. And I think that's interesting and, and it's something to continue to look into, continue to examine. We'll continue to talk about this because, hey, Christian faith has a lot to do with what we get in Britain. And this conflict between Wales and England over Christianity is a big one. And so we will come back to this probably in a few episodes when we start to talk about uh, Augustine and his mission to the Anglo-Saxons and what that meant for the, the Celtic Church in Wales. And thank you very much for sticking with me. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your comments, your suggestions, your questions seeking advice. I may not be always able to, to give you a good suggestion and a good trail to travel down, but I'll do my best. I'll continue to look and, and help out as much as I can. And if I find, you know, if you're asking me something that's sort of out of where we are historically at the moment, I will look for it and I will make an attempt to find out what I can. And I'll give you at least something to go with, hopefully. If there's anything I can do, anything we can, we can talk about, continue to discuss. If you want to reach me, you can reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can reach me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. You can also reach us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. If you want to follow everything we do across all our various podcasts, videos, streaming accounts, everything like that, you can find us at distractionsmedia.com. And, uh, Thank you, everyone, and have a great day, and we'll see you later. And uh, as it is when this episode is released, March 17th, have a very happy St. Patrick's Day to all our Irish friends. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.